Hi, everyone, and welcome to our talk with our headliner, Katrina McPherson. I'm Kelly Garrett, and I'm really excited to be here. Um, we're going to have a really great chat talking about Katrina's life. This is her life, and mm -hmm. uh, I want to first do the official bio, which I got from your website. So hopefully it's up to date. If not, it's not my fault. It's your fault, Katrina. <laughs> All right. So Katrina, she, her, was born in Scotland and lived there until 2010, until immigrating to California, where she lives on Patwin ancestral land. Is that how you say it? A former, a former academic linguist, she now writes full time. Her multi award winning and national best selling work includes the Dandy Gilver historical detective stories, The Last Ditch Mysteries set in California, and a strand of contemporary standalone novels that include Edgar finalist The Day She Died and Mary Higgins Clark finalist Strangers at the Gate. She is a member of Mystery Writers of America, the Crime Writers Association the Society of Authors and Sisters in Crime, of which she is a former national president, and how I know Katrina is through SYNC, which is Sisters in Crime. Um, and so that's where I met her, but obviously um, she's done a lot of other things besides that. So. so I wanted to kind of first, I guess, go start back. And I always want to know with, with fellow mystery writers, um, do you remember basically how you fell in love with the genre? And like, what was the first mystery that you read? And like, what was it about it that you loved so much? Right. So I sh should say to people, thank you, Kelly, <laughs> uh, for a start. And also say to people that Kelly did, didn't did tell me everything that we were going to talk about, but did give me the heads up of <laughs> ask things like, what was your first mystery? So that I'm not going to sit here going, um, in for the next 25 minutes. I've still got it because I, 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 I went and got it off my shelves. Oh, nice. Because when I, when I moved here, I did not move light. Because I brought well, things good. like <laughs> right, okay. So can you see that the, the treasure, treasure hunters? Yes, by Enid Blyton. Um, this was not new when I was a child. I'm old, but I'm not that old. I think <laughs> it was maybe um, my mum's. And the reason I fell in love with it is it's got a map that, and I'm still a sucker for a map in a book. I can't find it now. Oh yeah, here we go. Look. So when you got I'm to the sure map, that's what it was? It's, <laughs> it's a book about um, some children. Uh, you know, and they're nefarious strangers and, you know, they're looking for hidden treasure and there's a map and that's what it was. Also, um, when I was at school, there was this kind of well-meaning but ultimately misguided um, reading initiative in the 70s called SRA, School Reading Abomination. I don't know what it's, what it's good for. So, but yeah, I don't know. Uh, you had to go, you just picked a card out of a box and it had a sort of a little story thing on it and then you had to colour things in and find words and stuff and there was one called Terry the Tech short for detective oh. um, I remember that because it, someone stole something and Terry the Tech says Jacques you stole the thing and the accused person says I didn't steal the pen I must have been seven and thought that's pathetic that's such a clunky clue. I oh, can no. remember. I, you were judgmental little, from the beginning. <laughs> seven-year-old me <laughs> going, tell, you could oh, better. that's limp. <laughs> come on, people, come on. So, yeah, it was always it was always coming from a place, place of a great hubris and vanity and conceit, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Question is, so I've known that since I was five years old that I wanted to write. So was it like that that moment when you were like seven and you were like, I can I can write a better mystery than this. Is this when you decided that you wanted to be a writer? Yeah, I did. Yeah, really, really early. But I mean, I went to the kind of public school that had big boxes of cards with tape on them instead of books, right? So, I, yeah, maybe it wasn't that bad. But where I was from at uh, that time and that place and that class, that blue collar town, it was just, you know, I might as well have said I want to be a princess or, you know, I want to be, a, I want to, to fly on a magic carpet. Yeah. So it took a long time. And I think this might have been somewhat similar for you as well, Kelly, that you kind of wanted to do it. But we didn't have, or I didn't have, what some kids have got now, where they just walk into the room. Remember that viral video of that little girl that burst into her dad's meeting? Like that, oh, yes, you know? yes. <laughs> I, we, I didn't have that. I'd never met a writer. I didn't know. I remember finding out that books were written by people. I remember the day that I worked out what that name was oh, that fine. was on the book that wasn't the title and realized that there were people that made this happen. But it felt like so many mountain ranges over from anything I could ever do. So I didn't start till I was 35. So then what, what was it that um, 
it's funny because you say that, but then you also have a PhD in linguistics, which I feel like <laughs> that's pretty fancy. You know, that to me is fancier. And so what made you kind of realize that that you could finally do that at 35? What ha- like what happened? Well, what so I yeah, I went to university, first one in my family to go to university. That's awesome. And then I did a PhD. And then I got a tenure track position at you know, a fairly decent university. I was really, really bad at it. And I really hated it. And I was very, very, very unhappy. You were bad. Might, as, I don't, I don't buy oh, that you were bad as a professor. You're so I was, No, I was okay. I was okay at teaching. And I loved the students, little apple faced goths and punks and weirdos. I just loved them. Um, and I, you know, I was interested in the subject, but I couldn't do the politics. I couldn't do working in a university department. I didn't understand yeah. what people were. And my husband's an academic, so and he can do it. And he says, he might just be being kind, he's well trained, <laughs> but he says, you don't have enough like bitterness and ambition to work. Are you, are out you too happy? What's you're too going happy. on? <laughs> yeah. Well, he says you. You know, you're sitting in meetings, going, "What is going on?" And what's going on is people are scrabbling for very, very small pieces of advantage. Yeah. And he says you never got that. Cause you couldn't care less. So I just sat there, lost. Didn't know what was going on. Anyway, so um, it was because I hated that job so much that, and I, th- and I think. At that time, everybody was in a book club. So this would be like the late 90s. Like every woman between 30 and 60 was in a book club. And Oprah was, had just, oh, Oprah's yes. book club had just gone yes, that was bang. That. And all of a sudden, writers became these people who were just like normal people, you know? They were, they were all over the place and they were being interviewed. And I went to the Edinburgh Book Festival and I saw them at it kind of thing. They're more and accessible. Thought, yeah I can I can do this so I so I resigned from my tenure track position in a in a reckless career move but it's funny I was going to ask you this later but like let's jump into that now like what so I obviously am a writer but I still have a day job so as much as I want to be like I want to jump I do want to eventually be a full-time writer but like that scares me the idea of just quitting my job and jumping into it so what like what gave you the courage to to fully jump into the deep end out the gate Yeah. So I was on a weekly commute to this university, which was in the north of England from home where I lived with my husband. This is slightly key. And, you know, and I think living with someone who's really unhappy is probably a drag. And so we when we did the sums, we thought maybe I can just afford to do some part time teaching for a for a distance Mm. learning university. Yeah. And and also and here's when people say. Uh, or here's when people say oh I'd love to do that but I can't and what we did was we sold our house okay so it was a big investment we sold this house but we didn't like it very much and we moved into a rented a big old mad scruffy isolated rented farmhouse for a peppercorn rent and, so you, and I so, stayed there and, so you guys sold your house so you could pursue your dream yeah that's amazing that's how awful it is to live with me when I'm not happy <laughs> He was like, ah, whatever, what can we yeah, do? Let's yeah, sell no. the house, put it for sale. Oh, God, we loved that house though. We moved into this house and it was, and I use, it's the house that I put in the child garden years later, a sort of love letter to this house. It was so inconvenient and so nuts and big and ramshackle and isolated. And oh, I just loved it. And again, it seemed like a reckless move. But then when we moved, like when we left, when we moved to the US, it was in 2010, and house, you couldn't sell houses. People were stuck with them. Yeah. And we didn't have a house to sell. So it worked out really, yes. we were fortunate. But the, what you were saying, what, like, when did I give up, completely give up working? So I was still teaching part-time. When okay, I gave so up the, working, yeah, it was when I had six figures of advance money. That's the key. That two helps. contracts. <laughs> I never had a six-figure advance. I had two advances that, that added up to, like, from different publishers, and okay, thought, so well, there you go. So that so basically, you had so you had finished the first dandy book at that mm-hmm. point, and you yeah. so and then you guys sold it. You sold the book. Yeah. And then that's when you were like, "Let me. I have this. I have this six figure advance because you sold it in the U.S. and U.K. Or is it? It was a different book. Yeah, you sold. yeah. I sold it in okay. the U.K. No, I sold world like world rights. So okay, I sold it everything. I sold toes. You know. And then what was the second book deal then? It was the, oh, no, it was not mystery fiction. It was, 
you know, and it sort of could have been if I'd given it a nudge, but it was just what they call women's fiction, because I'm a woman and I wrote fiction. <laughs> That's always really bothered me. It was a novel. If I'd been a guy, it would just have been a novel, but it was that women's fiction. fiction but it would have been literature, literature. Yes, it would have been literature. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so that, so that's what it was. It was a financial decision to. I mean, we were probably about the same between part-time teaching and and part-time writing after we sold the house, and then so I then, got these two big advances and and packed it in. So then, okay, so you have this other book, but clearly you decided to go the mystery route. You did not go the women's the literature i will say that route. so what, <laughs> no. what what made you decide to to fully embrace the mystery route then uh it's, honestly people only say that when they're lying but no or when they're nervous about the fact that they're going to say something because the experience of writing crime fiction so that was the the first of the 1922-23 set detective stories was so open and free and warm and welcoming and <laughs> wonderful and you know whatever and the readers are you know we can do anything and let's have fun with it and the experience of those other two books it was a two book deal was very tentative and very rigid and mm. here's what here's what the market will take and here's what you know you can't say this this is I remember one meeting where the editor said the problem with this book is we don't know what's going to happen and I thought what and realised that that you know to, to that they put my book into the genre where it didn't quite fit, change the title and then change the story to match the title, and then put a jacket on to match the story that was changed. And I ended up I ended up writing a book I wouldn't read. So, so the dandy book was yeah. more what you what you want, yeah. the book you wanted to you wanted to write. And I let's Weird go back to that a little bit because um, so one of the things that people talk about when I see like when they're talking about your dandy books is how you seamlessly interweave historical facts in the books. And you, I know you also include like facts and fictions at the end of it. And so like why like what was it about historical? And then like is that and like do you just like love research a lot? Like. Like, what about that and how people spoke at the time? Like, did your PhD in linguistics help at all with, like, with you deciding to write, to write this book set in the 20s? Yeah, that's a really, that's a really good question because that wasn't the 20s at all. It was the golden age. It was my, I had already put a book in a drawer after 40 rejections when I wrote that Dandy Gilver novel. It what, was, what kind of book was know, that? It was, it was almost mystery fiction. Oh um, it was the it was the book it was it was the book you have to write if you've been doing academic writing for all these years it it was so somber and it was so like packed with portent and it had no playfulness about it at all so glad no one bought it but I eventually turned it into a book that was published as a uh, what was it called come to harm okay. uh, which was a mystery um so I'd given up on that and so I wanted to write something just to cheer myself up and I, so I wrote something, a kind of love letter to the golden age of detective fiction, which happened to be in the 20s and 30s. So it was never the time. It was never it was mm. never history. It was that genre. Um, and so I wrote one set in 1922 not really that interested in the history, but then I really wanted to write one set in 1926 when the general strike happened. So there were nine days in the middle of May in Britain where the aristocracy and the gentry and, and you know, the kind of the manager class thought there was going to be a revolution. There was this uprising of uh, workers. And I thought, oh God, that'd be such fun to write Dandy Gilver undercover as a servant. So she's on the other side of this, this great split so that was when it was, so that was four books in when I got interested in history, uh, in what was happening in the the outside world, as well as my little bubble of um, uh, this weird imaginary place where amateur sleuths can solve mis murders. They never did that. It's but so I, but the, Sorry, go ahead. It's so interesting because you're saying like you're not, so you're basically not a history buff, but you, st mm -hmm. you still had to put all the research and spend so much time. I think that's the reason why I don't write his, like people are like, oh, you should write this b book about this time. And I'm like, I don't want to, I don't have the energy to put all that time into doing the research mm -hmm. that's needed, you know? So obviously you must like, you must like to do some research, correct? Well, Kelly, <laughs> here's the thing. <laughs> I am a graduate of MSU. <laughs> making stuff up and uh -oh. honest to god <laughs> if you make stuff up with enough gusto no one ever 
calls you on it. I have made up so much stuff. But you just do it with enough detail and with enough brio and people. And sometimes it goes wrong. Like I, there was one night at a library in Scotland where a woman turned up really disheveled and hot and sweaty and so cross because uh, she'd been looking for uh, the castle that was in my book. It doesn't exist. Well, it does exist, but it's a hundred miles away and I just dragged it there and set it there. And she'd been tramping around, you know, slapping at insects and getting caught in brambles all day looking for it. So it can go wrong. Well, that, but so mostly, that was my, but the, I was going to say that. I was going to say like, oh, it must be that most people don't want to do research themselves to like prove you right or wrong, right? <laughs> I just like, oh yeah, I'm not going to look that up. The, like, Katrina's correct. The research, <laughs> the research that I do, the research that I do do though doesn't come from my academic life at all. I spent two years working in a local studies library, like a local history library, and um, while Neil was doing his PhD after I finished my master's and he was still studying and I was waiting because we couldn't afford to be two students together and it was that two years when I was working in this um, archive library that I found out I found out what there is like what you can what you can find and how to ask for it and I think that has stood me in much better stead as far as research goes than anything I did in university it used to drive my colleagues mad because I'd go back in when I didn't work there anymore and I was writing and say oh hey can I see that thing you've got something to do with like theatre bills in the festival theatre in the 30s somewhere down in the stacks and they'd give me this look that say like I really wish you could just go and get it yourself because we keep that quiet we don't really want you know want people secrets. to know that yeah exactly so, so then, then how do you get, get like the, the the details that you do get now that you're not you're not there anymore now that you're in California? Yeah, it's thankfully. I mean, um, the the changes in what's available on the internet have come along just in nice time for me leaving the yes. country. <laughs> that there were things you don't have to send people down into the stacks nearly as much as yeah. you used to. I mean, the combination of the post office directories which go street by street, like what businesses, what shops and what people lived in, which buildings and the Ordnance Survey map. So you can look at the wiggly little streets and then you can read who lived there and what they did, put them together online and you're laughing. It's great. That's pretty cool. I didn't realize you could do all that. Yeah, it's really very, cool. it's very cool. So even though I know you don't want to consider yourself to be an expert, but it's funny. I was like talking to my friend and I had my hair a certain way and she's like, oh, you look like the 20s. And I said, well, it is the 20s. And she was like, oh, it is the 20s. And I was it's like, yeah. Time. You know, yeah. and so I'm like wondering, especially now with like the pandemic and anything, do you see anything similar like going on from your research of the 20s back then? So our, what's going on with our 20s? I know like- Weirdly, like, yeah, weirdly. Because one of the things that was really always so strange about golden age fiction was that no one ever talked about the Spanish flu, right? Yeah. It, you can read Agatha Christie, Dorothy Sayers, Michael Innes, Niall Marsh. Marjorie Allingham, all that lot. And you would never know what happened. I mean, you can look at the screwball comedies and yeah. well, I suppose it's a bit late for that. Like it never happened. Yeah. And now we're going through exactly the same thing. Everybody's yeah. on the phone to their editor going, Do we do we talk about it? So what do we do we like what how do you write a book set in 2020? That was my I, I was going to ask you that later, but let's ask about it now. Um, because here's one thing. So we we haven't talked about your books yet, but one thing I I I've read all the last stitch series mysteries and it's I've read three of them and um the you have characters in there one who I guess do you want to call Kathy like a germaphobe how would you talk how would you describe Kathy, yeah germaphobe yeah you know and so when I read the first two was pre-pandemic and like she would be like wiping everything down and like you know being so obsessed with touching people and distancing and hand sanitizer and I would just be like that's a lot but then I literally just read Scott on the rocks to make sure for this conversation <laughs> and she was doing the same thing and this time I'm going Yes, exactly. Yep. There you Good. go. Like, you know, and so, <laughs> yeah. and it's funny because I know you did not write it. You did not write that book, you know, during the pandemic. So I'm curious, yeah. do you think you're going to handle it to, to, to mention the pandemic or, or, or do it with your, especially with that series, but also with the standalones too? Like, how do you think you're going to handle the pandemic? I have, I've turned in okay. what I'm calling working title, Lockdown Lexi. It's not <laughs> going to be called that. But so book four in this in the um, Last Ditch Motel series is set um, starting on Friday the 13th of March 2020 and it runs for about a week and a half. And I talked about it as, uh, you know, because it's set in a motel run by a germaphobe. 
And I said to uh, the, it was uh, this, our book was already contracted. And I said to the editor, what, what do you think? It would be a good way to get people locked in together and do a closed circle mystery. You know, it would be, it would be a nice excuse to have that little group of people. And she said, aha. And then in the autumn last year, when I was start, was going to start to write it, I thought, I'll just check because, you know, things were, you know, we were months into it. Yeah. And so I said, do you still think it's a good idea? And she said, aha, yeah, go for it. Let's let's see what happens. And I've just finished it and I've turned it in. And uh, she hasn't read it. My agent's read it. And she said it's like historical fiction now because it's in March and they're saying things like, um, oh, well, we won't still be here in June, will we? It'll be all, it'll be over by June. Right. And everybody's bleaching their shopping and the stuff that we did a way back then. Um, so I worked with the the um, a printout of what came from Sacramento, from the governor's office day by day, like what was happening every day out there in the real world. And then had this little microcosm of the last ditch um, where someone dies. So, so you, you're still doing research, like live action, it's like live action research. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just to, to kind of peg it so that that feeling of, and the big one was the day they shut Disneyland, you know, that was, I think for, for people in California, they closed Disneyland and they gave people a tax filing extension on the same day. And I still can remember that day when they, when was when that? they did was it, that when was that, that was that? March yeah it was quite early yeah it was quite I was, early um, but it's I was telling I was at left coast crime um, yeah I was at left coast crime yes so, so I so were, I started I've started the book the day that we all left we were in San Diego seems mad now but and we and we drove oh Neil came to get did, me. I remember, remember that. that crazy day yes you that, made him drive all the way down I remember that I was like no no no, no 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 I'm gonna have to take issue with that and I sort of well no okay I did <laughs> what I did was I phoned and said they've shut us down I've got to come home but the, the airline the phones are jammed and you can't hire a car I you just I, you know there's just it's just pandemonium and he said I'll come and get you so he's not bad, you know. Because you guys turned around pretty quick. So I remember I saw him. And we were hanging out. Yeah. We just so. thought we'd go home. Yeah. yeah. We just, I know he drove, he drove almost down and then slept in a hotel and then came down to San Diego and we just hooked it. And as we were driving home, the Starbuckses were shutting. You know, the first one they yeah. said, um, we'll just give you a coffee, but you have to get out. And the, the second one we came to, they said, stay in your car, <laughs> stay in your car. And then by the time we were almost home, Starbucks was shut. So it was a it was a very strange day. So how we'll it... see. I don't know how it's going to go. I don't know how it's going to go. Well, how, how was that like cathartic for you to write about? Because it's it, that's interesting to me. It's like we're, I'm like, there's certain things that I know in history books that in my life I'm living through history. You yeah. know, and for me, it's like 9-11, Obama winning um, election and now this. You know, and so like, how was it like knowing that you're literally like writing about history? You know what I'm saying? Like, you, it's going to yeah. be history. Was that cathartic for you? Was it like, did you kind of have a, a, a were you were you more involved? Do you think when like versus writing a dandy versus because because you're living through it, or was it like just more like just business as usual? It was. It felt like I was writing something more recent than I'd ever written, but it yeah. felt further away than anything I had ever written as well because it was just the, the innocence of us then here we are yeah. the innocence of us then last march thinking oh yeah but it won't it won't come here Good and it's weeks. not really it's like we were i was speaking to my agent about it after she'd read it and she said she you know she's very flattering she's very nice we've been together for a long time but she was saying you you caught how we were under and over reacting at the same time we were reacting massively to all the wrong stuff and hugely under reacting to how hard we were going to have to dig in for how long it was going to last yeah. um, and also I think because it was the beginning that there were like 500 cases in the state um and so it doesn't feel, I did cut one scene because I just thought, oh God, no, that's too, it's too harsh from now when people have hurt so much and you can't play this for laughs. And I don't even want to talk about it. Um, I mean, because, you know, we've got to have a sliver of ice in our hearts to write comedy, but we're not monsters, you know? I think that's one of, one of the things I've said this before, where it's like, I think sometimes with lighter weight amateur detective novels, people tend to 
not take them as seriously as like, you know, the big tough, like, oh, here comes the big tough, smart talking, you know, successful tough guy. He's going to come in and shoot everybody in the room with one gun. And I'm like, to me, murder is the worst thing you can do for like to somebody is to kill them. And so to make murder funny to me is harder than to just come into a room and like shoot everybody up. And it's so fun. It's just so funny that when you started to talk about it, it, because it's always sort of amused me almost, you know, the sense that there's gritty realism and there's fluffy fantasy, because to me, there's dark fantasy and light fantasy. None of us, maybe a very few, but none of us are writing what crime is actually like. I mean, crime is stupid. It's, it's tedious and, and pathetic. And, you know, it's, it's drunk and brainless and rotten and awful. It's not clever. You know, it's not twisty. It's not glamorous, but those guys, those I write about the mean streets, think, yeah, no, you write about it. You sit and type in your jammies, same as me, calm down. That's exactly, exactly. And I said, it's not as anything more realistic than, than what we're doing over here. So, so have you ever been, has anyone ever said, has, have you had a version of that question where people say, do you think you would ever write a, a real book? Because I've written some sort of almost serious, you know, like psychological dramas, but you've written comic books, like laugh out loud funny. But has anyone ever dared to ask you that? No, they never described it as real books. They've asked if I've, if I've, I've planned to like, to branch out and actually I am I'm writing domestic right. suspense I guess right now um but it still has it still has humor in it which is what I was what I appreciate about but all of your books is that even with the ones that are serious you have humor and yeah yeah you know, I think I mean I write serious books but people still find ways to laugh I think I can yes. write I mean God, I've written that book set on a psychiatric hospital inside a firing range you know that's not Doris Day is it but I think I don't think I could write a solemn book because I think that people in dire or my people anyway the kind of people I write about even in dire situations they find a way to to laugh even if it's gallows humor there are always going to be laughs so it's never going to be and you know really solemn books really earnest books make me laugh uh, I'm they not take themselves particularly, seriously. Yeah, I'm not particularly proud of it, but Cormac McCarthy, I just I just start to have to bite my cheeks because it's just so relentless. Yeah. No, I think I think even I think every book needs humor. And even um like I have a screenwriting background and there it's not necessarily humor, but like you just can't be up here all the time. You have to break it up. Yeah. You know, and so in, in books and in, in movies, it's usually they have like the um like right after the like the midpoint, it's like a lighter thing to get the heart rate back down so you can build it back up. You know, and I think yeah. the same thing. Where I can't I can't be scared the entire book and like not wanting to read. And like you have to have those moments of levity to break it up, you know. So I think yeah. every book could use could use some kind of humor in it. It doesn't have to be like laugh out loud slapstick, but you know, it's to have that moment to like lighten it up. So yeah, because I think I can't imagine uh, wanting to spend time with a real person. Who, who I was going to say who had no sense of humor but if you've ever met someone who's got no sense of humor once you realize that that's what's going on it's hysterical yeah but it's not but you're not you're not sharing it with them so it does feel a bit cruel but it, it, it's always really amazing to meet someone who's got no sense of humor at all and so a book I wish it's like we're post die hard right because die hard changed everything you, now you've got to have laughs yeah. even in action thrillers post die hard that, even, that could happen to our genre I'd be fine but also I think in real life I know we've had so many um this has been a rough year to put it as an understatement and I still on uh, my Lex is talking so ignore her um like I like love like like BuzzFeed will do like you know tw- funniest tweets about the election funniest tweets about the impeachment funniest tweets about the pandemic and I like look forward to that because I'm like I would I, I take a I'd rather laugh than cry mentality about things you know mm-hmm. and so like this that idea is like I can't believe this is going on this is unreal you know so the idea that <laughs> to bring yeah. some humor yeah. into that like to me helps me yeah in real life so of course it's gonna Very be much. the same in a book you know mm. so and I think it's similar. I mean I think certainly for Scot- Scottish people I mean I'm not saying I'm not, I'm not patting us on the back and saying oh we've got the best sense of humor and I can't stand professional Scots but certainly finding the laugh is our default setting always you know 
Yeah. I mean, I just, I just, I just, I don't know. I don't, I want, I need to laugh. I just have to. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. I remember my, my mum at her mother's funeral cracking up in the front row and people afterwards saying you could see all your shoulders going up and down and other people in the crematorium were, were like quite shocked but we were so well of course we are what else are you going to do you know but also to me like I think celebrating a life you know like celebrate like I my, my my dad would want me to be happy you know what I'm saying yeah. celebrating his life no no this was my mum saying my god it's freezing you think we could light a fire that's what we were. That's what we were saying. <laughs> we were so, never mind. Funeral. Yeah, I know. So, yeah, she's very dry. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, um, we've got to laugh. So I, I have my preset question. So one of the things that I love about you is that you are so supportive of other authors. <laughs> you know, and, like, even if you go to your website, like, one of the first things you see is, like, what I'm reading right now. You go on your Facebook, you always are, have, you always getting book mail. And so I'm curious, like, what was, like, who's, like, that first author you remember who was, which was nice to you? And, like, what was it a conference? Like, what was it? I know you were saying that the reason why you kind of veered towards crime fiction was because the people seemed a little nicer. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, my first... I went to a Society of Authors thing in Newcastle in Britain and met a writer called Jean Hill and a writer called Aline Templeton. Um, and you always remember those two people. And Aline Templeton writes a series about a detective sergeant in a rural, I was going to say rural practice, rural constabulary in Scotland. And she's a she herself, Aline, is a retired um, headmaster's wife from a very snooty, snooty, shouldn't say that from a very prestigious uh, boarding school in Scotland and she's so competent and so unflappable and so different from almost every other writer I've ever met yeah. but she was the first she was the first one uh, that I met and she was she kind of took me under her wing oh, and nice. um and gave me the sense that it was all doable so that was brilliant and I really admire I admire her writing um, as well she writes about the place where I used to live which is always good um, but I mean seriously I've only met two or three people in what 20 years now that I would not get in a lift with or a car maybe two maybe we'll, three we'll discuss the names two after two this I maybe not even, <laughs> not even one I don't even mean that I don't mean that in the don't get in a taxi with him kind of me two times up way I just mean because it would be like oh god no not you please you know everybody's people are very people are very I think supportive in general we yeah, don't seem to so. have that you know you keep reading that thing that we're in competition with each other and you think that's bananas yeah. readers I, re I read a book a week I write maybe two a year so you've got people have got to keep people someone else has got to write to keep people reading yes so that they're still reading when your next book comes out we're not in competition and even oh, when we are in competition like for an award there was a time recently where um Susanna Calkins and James Ziskin and I were three of the five people who were up for a historical McCavity award and so we just all sat together at the same table thinking we'll make it more likely that someone at our table is going to win. And we composed a joint speech um, that we, that could be used. And um, I can't remember who won. It wasn't me. But it was, it <laughs> Do you was think it was Jay? Was, was it, it one of the three? <laughs> I don't, look but, you know, I can't even remember because it so didn't, it so much didn't matter because there's that yeah. moment of I didn't win. <gasps> someone I love won. Yeah. There's a tiny minute of I didn't win. And then you're just happy again. I have, um, so I, I've, I've been, I've been should... against, yes, I've been against you and I think the yeah. lefty awards and I was so happy when you won. It helps when there's a friend and it's like, you like them as a person, you know? Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's lovely. It's lovely. Huh. I don't know. We're not in competition. What was the question? Supportive. Yes. Yeah. I, yeah. so I guess I didn't, add, I didn't put this on our sheet of paper, but, um, so in terms of, cause you moved here in 2010, correct? Yeah. Um, did you spend a lot of time in the States promoting books or doing any kind of books up before you moved here? Oh God, no. I'd been, I'd been on visits. I, uh, I was here. I wrote a book here. Um, Neil was on a little short sabbatical in Worcester, Ohio in the winter. And so I lived in this Hilton Garden Hotel uh, for six weeks and wrote a whole book because there was nothing else to do. It was brilliant. It was the most fantastic writing experience. Um, I wrote a Dandy Gilbert novel and then went out and ate Amish food every night. It was great. 
And so I'd I'd been, you know, I'd been to New York and I'd been I'd never been west of Colorado when we moved to California. And I'd mostly been on the East Coast. Um but I know I hadn't I had never been published in America when we moved here. What were your expectations? So I hadn't been here. Like what were your expectations? Hmm. I thought it would be the same as New York, you know, it's just I mean I've been to America, I know what's what. I didn't think it would be different. Um and I and I didn't think it would be um startling because we grew up on on American films and television in Britain and because American culture was so uh dominant and so I thought I'd slide right in and nothing would phase me so the biggest surprise was that anything was surprising you know that the biggest surprise was that I felt so completely at sea I wasn't <laughs> expecting that at all how long did um, it take you to get your legs your sea legs um probably six, well I you know how do we measure that? If we measure that by I dared to write a book set here, then it was six yeah. years because it took six years to because I remember at first going, I can't I cannot write a book set here. I don't know how anything yeah. works. I don't know anything. Yeah. So six years. That's yeah. what I love. It's, she's, we're talking about the last six, the Lexi series. That's what I love about it is, is she's such a fish out of water. And so did you <laughs> did you know you wanted to one day write a book set here or was it like after after being here for six years, you're like, I'm going to, I have to write this. I have to write about this experience. Being a Scott in the yeah, I think it was, I wanted to write a book. Well, my editor at the time said, we want another series from you. And you know what it's like, Kelly, you, you know, if someone, you, everybody's trying so hard to, to make a career of this. If someone says we want a book, yeah. it's like asking an actor, can you ride a horse? Yes. And then you worry about how you're going to do it later. So, and she said, we'd like something set here right here and I thought well I can't write an American voice so I'll have to have a, a Scottish character and then it's when I thought I could just give her all my mistakes that I made when I first got here and just make her say all the things that I thought but didn't say when I first got here so that's what Lexi was in that first book she was basically me like a lost lamb out on a hillside going how does this work what's the what's escrow <laughs> oh, I, don't know how to, I can't how do you make this checkbook go into this cover I don't know what to <laughs> no, do not the it's oh, so small so... things like that like the checkbook that's so oh interesting. yeah it's yeah just, I, just I, I mean I drove around I didn't know you had to put those sticky things on the back of your car I just drove around going oh they've sent us some stuff okay I didn't <laughs> know anything and so, didn't ask I don't know why I didn't ask you need a you need a, a mentor, an American mentor, to help you transition. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um. So now we know how you you started the second series, but what about the standalones? Because a lot of times it's funny people get pigeonholed and like, oh well, if you write historical, you should always write historical. So how did you start like decide to start writing standalones? Oh well, yeah, that is weird, isn't it? Because no one's ever said, apart from these two women's fiction, those had a different name. But no, inside the crime genre or the mystery genre, no one's ever said pick a different name they've they've always and it's always been different publishers they're quite happy to have my name on the front and um, it's not quite the way it looks because the first thing I wrote was standalone and then these two uh, one these two books that you know that ultimately I didn't pursue after so I had done those three and then I wrote as she left it which was the first standalone so I'd probably written only maybe one more Dandy Gilver than the other ones. It's okay. just that Dandy Gilver was successful and these weren't. So it looked as if it was a huge departure. Mm. But basically it was just that one of them succeeded finally, one of them took. Um, and I do, you know, I like I like them because Dandy Gilver is not me at all. She's posh, she's English, she's very stoic, she's very conservative, she's very, and they are, they, you know, they are what they are. It's not real life and there are some stories that just don't fit that milieu you know they have yeah. to be they have to be modern and they're much more personal these stories let's talk about I mean, we haven't talked really about dandy a lot and so um obviously how many has it been 14 yeah 14 well i've finished you, the 15th yeah yeah I think congratulations on finishing you know so i'm very curious um i know like when the when the turning tide which is up for a lefty She's now a grandmother, you know, so you, you really kind of, you have her going through time and like, not like real time, but really it's been real time because it's been over a decade since yeah. with the series. Um, so when you first came up with her, how did you come up with her as the character? But in, when you envisioned her, when you started, how has she changed 
in the course of these 14 books. So she, she's still the same person you envisioned her being when you got the mm. first idea when she came to you. Yeah, it's funny that, isn't it? I, I worked out all the kind of practical things about her. It's sitting on a beach in Scotland, freezing cold, um, with a clipboard, tra- thinking, right, what am I going to write after the 40 rejections? Um, and I thought, uh, like, what's her name? Where does she live? What's her, you know, what's her, uh, is she married? Does she have children? What age is she? Where Where does she live? Because I wanted her to be a private detective. So I, so I wrote down all these kind of physical or, or peripheral things. But as far as her character is, she's not me yeah. at all. And she's nothing like me. I'm nothing like her um, and don't aspire to be. But I don't know. I don't know where she came from. She might have a little bit of my oldest friend, who is also nothing like me. She's much more um, stoic and much more uh, competent. Is that the word? Pro? No, I don't quite mean competent. Words are hard. Words are hard, aren't they? But she's she's much less of an overreactor. I'm a noted overreactor. <laughs> it's a skill. Um, but and Dandy just she just arrived uh, fully formed yeah she did but she has changed and I think she's changed because she was the kind of bored upper class uh, wife who did basically nothing of any import not much of any value except you know she was kind to her kids and things but then when she started investigating cases she went into different I mean not just undercover in that house as a servant but she also went to miners villages and she into little shops and uh, she was in a convent at one point so she's just seen more life than women of her class and her time usually do and she's also she's not seen it from up here she wants something from these people and she's got to engage with them on their level so she's much less um, stuffy than she was at the start and more I think more interesting to me because I always kind of regretted making her posh it was a practical decision she had to have a car and she had to have free time and she had to be not like her neighbours going oh she's no better than she should be you know she had to be able I think rich women then were very free and most other women weren't so she had to be and I regretted it when did you regret it though? Like what book were you at? Like four, five? Uh, yeah, I think by book, um, before, I, before I finished book one, when I realized that the interesting people that she was dealing with were the people who lived in the, in the cottages around about and that it wasn't the family who'd had their diamonds stolen right. weren't that interesting to me it was that it was the other ones it was the the pub landlord and the, the woman who was making the beds who were having the interesting lives that we don't that we don't hear about you know yeah. so much mm-hmm. like I would be if I was in the 20s because people go oh the 20s it was so glamorous you know I was thinking if I was in the 20s I'd be wearing wooden shoes like my <laughs> family you know yeah it wouldn't have been glamorous yeah so um, I know you, so you don't, I want to talk about your writing process a little bit. You don't outline your pantser, which is what they, mm-hmm. what they call people who don't outline. You have a plotter who does outline. Um, so I want you to know like what your process was, because, you know, I think even for the series, you have to kind of start somewhere with it. And like, even if it's like the nugget of the investigation. So um, like, let's get, like use the, the, the turning tide as an example, like, Mm-hmm. How did you come up with that initial idea of a woman, a fairy woman who um, is having a problem and there's a, a murder going on and they th- she, she thinks herself she, she did it or was at fault for it. So how did yeah. that like, so yeah. can, can you like walk us through that process using the turning tide as much as you can, at least without spoiling us? Oh, that's such a good way to approach it, to say yeah. let's use one book instead of just, you know, I, unfortunately mm-hmm. with the turning tide. So what where I start with is with setting. So, so geographic setting and also kind of institutional setting or cultural setting. So it's a girls boarding school on the Southwest coast, or it's a, it's a convent on the Lanark Moor, or, you know, it's the, it's Christmas time in the herring fishing villages, you know, or whatever. So so a place and also a, a kind of cultural space. Mm-hmm. Um, so I went to, have you read The Turning Tide? Have you looked at it? No. Oh, you have? You've got it. All right. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah. so when it's set, there's a, so there's a, t- there's a coast, there's a tidal island. There's this yeah. little island, Crammond Island, that gets cut off twice a day. And it's near where I grew up. So it was a rite of passage. Everybody went there either to 
to hope not to get cut off or to hope to get cut off, depending on how much of a, a bad girl or bad boy you were. I'm not going to say what I did. Um, <laughs> And also there's great um, precedent in the mystery genre for a tidal island, right? From And, and then there were none set in a tidal island. So I went to Cramond and while I was there, I found out why, and I can't say it because it's a massive spoiler, I found out why the ferry woman doesn't want to row across the river in good weather. Mm. She'll only go out in bad weather and then it gets even worse and she won't row at all. She puts people in a cart and takes them miles around to the nearest bridge so that's the initial puzzle but you know why I can't say it and then um the other thing that happened was that I walked up the river at Cramond and found out that there were three mills um who you know they they did different work but they all used the water of the river to for power and there were these three mills so you know you're a writer and you've you've written scripts the rule of three the yeah. idea that there are three of them you think oh well it's meant to be there are these three mills they've gone now I'm not slandering anyone I can put anyone I like into these three spots on this river and that is all I knew when I no there's two so there's two deaths and I knew that the first person had died because he dies before the book opens the second death that that was a surprise that that was what I knew so it's really because do you plot you plot right? I'm asleep. I like 25 page outlines yeah because every time when you said it today it was so funny when when a plotter says to a pantser I know you're a pantser but you must I mean you must <laughs> you have to do something you have to it can't be a truly blank page I do not believe yeah, I no. that's it would scare me so much it scares me it terrifies me <laughs> one recently it, I was on page 272 of a 280 page book and I didn't know what the solution to the murder was I was typing going I don't know who done it I don't know who done it I've really I've ruined it this time and then phew just at the last minute it, it yeah it out. always comes through it comes through right yeah but no it's not it's not relaxing yeah so I want to I had a couple of, of fun questions for you because we're almost we're almost out of time but I wanted to talk about one more thing so you've said and I think we talked about this a little bit earlier that your books are a mix of dark and light you know and obviously like I was like okay well you know Dandy and the standalones yes and I was like thinking about Last Stitch and I was like well they're really like just really funny books like you know I told you like I was like with Scott on the Rocks I was laughing like every other line like people were saying and things like that and I was like well that's just light and then I was thinking about it I'm like no Katrina like she talks about racism she talks about homophobia she talks about these very major things in the book she does not shy away from that because it's, it's a lighter book you know and even like um with Scott on the Rocks, people are, are kind of stealing statues. And these are statues of people of color, mm. you know? Mm. You know, and so, and it, but it, the interesting thing is that it still fits the tone of the book. You know, so I want to kind of talk to, about that if you can even, it, it might just be so natural to you, like about like why that's important to you and like, how are you able to kind of do that and keep that tone while still dealing with not shying away from these serious issues which you're not going to mm. you, you deal with issues that people aren't going to even deal with in serious books like racism and homophobia like a lot of white authors at least or straight cis white authors so. yeah oh god yeah i've got yeah i'm all the way there right um straight white cis all the rest mm -hmm. of it um i think what it is is these books are not realistic i mean they're capers really they're and they are light and they're they're warm and there's you know everything works out in the end but I think what I want, what I'm hoping to do is that unreality isn't a kind of unreality that's harmful. So it's not pretending the world is a way that it's not yeah. in such a way that it cuts people out. Yeah. So the things that are the things that are silly is like there's these two doctors, a pediatrician and, and what do you call it? An anesthesiologist. Yes. I said it right. An anesthetist, I would say, who live in a motel. Yeah. Um for reasons you know and there's a there's a, a germaphobe who runs a laundromat you know and so that that's not very realistic um but that's not a that's not an unrealism that's gonna hurt yeah. so I, so it's a kind of silly corner of a sort of real world I think I hope and I think the other thing is that because it's filtered through Lexi's um cluelessness because she's the straight white cis Person, newcomer yes. you know she's the one that that does everything wrong but it but she knows it matters and she she doesn't think it's cute to know nothing 
you know, I don't think it's cute to know nothing and I get things wrong. God, I get things wrong. Um, but that's, and so it's like the, someone's identity or the, or like, oh, the hilarious mix-ups that come from it. That's never the punchline. Um, I don't know if I'm making sense of that. But do you know what I was thinking though? You know, Valerie Wilson Wesley, curtsy, has <laughs> just brought out at uh, the start of a new cosy series. Yeah, Anyone who's listening, A Glimmer of Death, Valerie Wilson Wesley, it's, oh, it's a masterclass. And she, I mean, years ago, I was talking to her um, or uh, someone else had talked to her actually for a report that we were doing. And she was saying she was having a lot of trouble with the idea of an African-American cosy because African-American life isn't cosy. It, you can't mm. have this nice polka dot ice cream and sunshine little town where everything's lovely and god but she's done it right she's she's found the she's found the way to make a good life inside a hard world and make a cozy novel out of it and it's just genius you know yeah, and I, I think so. I as, as, a, as a black person I think that to me it's like I am black I will always be black I love being black but it's not like every day I wake up like, oh my God, it's so hard to be black. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's right. just not like my everyday existence. Obviously, my existence is going to be different than your existence of other people, any other race, any other gender too, because I'm a black woman. But it's yeah. like, there are, there's like, we have, we have fun too. Like, you know, and I think yeah. that's, I think a lot of times publishing too, they feel like with, with books by black people about black people, it has to always be about the struggle. Uh, you know, it, yeah. it has to be about how hard it is. Where and that's why I'm glad that Valerie is now doing the cozy paranormal she, cozy and Valerie Burns, yeah, yeah being Burns. But she's got Alexa that Gordon. But it's not um it's not an imaginary world where there no. are no problems. Right. So right. I am not saying I've done what she did, but I was but when I saw what she was doing, I was thinking that's kind of what I'm trying to do is make it like a happy book inside a world that's not, you know, like Pleasantville, you yes. know, so I think yeah, I think yeah. I agree. And I think so for me, like, because I have a black woman main character in all of my books and I always will, you know, it's like I. I address certain things about being black. Like I make a joke about her, um, like being the Rosa Parks of like fried chicken commercials, things like that, you know, and like acknowledging things, but I don't like, if I don't dwell on it, you know, yeah. I, it's, I acknowledge it, but I don't dwell on it. It's not about, important. it's not what it's about. And I think maybe, I wonder, it, like, it's not actually the, the last ditch books. That's not what it's about. It's like, there's a, like Shit's Creek. It's almost there are people here, but that's not that's not what it's about. People are living their lives and it's yes. not it's not about issues. Do you know the statues thing though? The statues was that was rough because this uh, I wrote it before um the the news about statues last year. And I just yeah. absolutely I am not I'm staying so far away from that because it's not there's just some things that you can't go, hey, I just wrote a book about that. It would yeah. be so unseemly. Yeah. So it felt it felt uncomfortably um relevant and I just yes. stayed off it. Yeah. Interesting. Between the pandemic and that, you are almost psychic in your Scott yeah. Rocks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so is there anything else you want to talk about? I think we're almost done. I want to have some fun questions for you. I wanted to make sure you you hit talk about everything you've wanted to talk about during this ask, conversation. Yeah, ask me fun, ask me fun questions. Yeah. Okay, so here's my fun question. So obviously we've talked about last ditch a lot. It's a fish out of water. Lexi, as we said, is a Scott in the US. You are a Scott in the U.S. You've been here now for what, 10, 11 10 years? Yeah, 11 10 years. years yeah. So I'm going to mention some American things and some, you know, British, UK things. I want to know which one you prefer. Okay. Ready? Mm. So no. football, football or soccer? Football is soccer. Next. <laughs> no. Either. <You> I'm <laughs> Yes. That's, that's my response, right? Okay. <laughs> uh, football. So, uh, soccer I mean soccer I was like great like, you like yeah. America okay round ball round <laughs> ball yeah <laughs> um coffee or tea uh coffee in the morning tea at tea time what, what is tea time uh, right I used to say to people I'll, I'll meet you at tea time and they'll go when is that <laughs> I think well, where am I happy hour tea time is between four and six <laughs> so you guys don't you don't you don't drink alcohol you drink tea tea yeah no there's, so is there no happy hour at in, over there Oh, there is now, but people, if you say tea time, people know what that means. And if you say happy hour, they go, ooh, you know. <laughs> you're trying to be, you're yeah. trying to be fancy. Um, scones or biscuits? They're the same thing. 
that you mean biscuits like not cookies you mean biscuits and gravy biscuits yeah that's a scone I was I remember the moment when we said we were in a, a diner in in Wyoming and Neil said what is a biscuit and this waitress put one on the table and we both went oh it's a scone <laughs> so when I say biscuit to you do you think it's a cookie yeah do you like do you still do you find yourself saying more Americanized wording like that? Like if you went to the to the diner and you wanted a, a biscuit or a scone, what would you say? I would say I would use the local language because otherwise it's just annoying. But the I do try language. and I'm trying not to merge so that I can so that I know which is which. The only one I can't remember is which is GPS and which is sat nav. I can never remember which is American and which is British. Well, GPS must be American because I don't even know okay. what the other one is. Sat nav, okay. satellite, satellite navigation, sat nav, that's what we call GPS. Yeah, I've never, so apparently. Yeah, it's, it's GPS, yeah. yes. <laughs> um, okay, so about, right. Okay, so fish and chips or chicken tenders and french fries? Oh, fish and chips. I don't think, well, I don't think I've ever had a, chi I don't know what a chicken tender is. I don't know it's, what that means. Okay, it's basically like a longer chicken nugget. Oh, a goujon, a goujon. Is that what it's called, a goujon? <laughs> yes. How pretentious does that sound? I have yeah. some chicken goujon. Although goose. chicken, chicken, chicken tenders is kind of a weird, like a tender. It's making me hungry. I would take, I you know, both. We also both. call them chicken, chicken fingers, which I guess makes a little, even though it's not, it's just because it looks like a finger, I guess. All right. I see, and I would get a hard time for seeing fish fingers, like, like that, fish sticks. That, fish that sticks. Is, is, yeah, is that we call them fish, fish fingers. Yeah. We should but. not judge. We, call, we say chicken fingers here. Okay. Any anything anything fried, I'm starving. Right. <laughs> um, mince pie or apple pie? Oh, m both. I mean, mince pie at Christmas and apple pie the rest of the year. Yeah. Okay. And there's then, so uh, many rules. There's so many rules <laughs> in my <Manhattan. laughs> Um, and then beans on toast or jelly on toast? Beans, beans I've on never, toast. I've never. How, had that's that. a weird thing, isn't it? That Boston baked beans are not breakfast food here. No, like there, I, that, like, that idea sounds like yeah. it to me. If you said, if you gave me baked beans, I'd just be like, this is why are you giving this to me? Where's my eggs at? Like, mm. where's my bacon? I don't want beans on, mm. uh, no. Beans where's never. Your bacon? Your bacon's on a funeral pyre. It's too crispy. No, that's not true, actually. <laughs> I do love American bacon. I do love American bacon, but I also want sausages and mushrooms and tomatoes and beans and hash browns on the plate all together. And all together with the, with the bacon? Yeah, but no fruit. I still can't do that. I cannot put fruit on the same plate as bacon. Why not? Because it's pudding, which means dessert, right? Because fruit is for afterwards. See, lot I of think rules, lot of rules. Yeah, I was gonna say for us, no <laughs> fruit. Fruit is fruit is for, it's for all all types of them. Yeah, all right. Well, mm -hmm. Katrina, thank you so much for again allowing me to talk to you and kind of pick your brain for like the last you know hour thank or so. You. Congratulations lovely. on your lefty nomination and on Thank you being the, the headliner for Suffolk Mystery Mystery Authors Festival. So, thank you for having awesome. me, Suffolk Mystery Authors Festival. And Kelly, thank you so much for doing this. Of course, I really enjoy talking to you as usual. So, see you Perfect. soon. We will or we won't see you soon. That's crazy, but we will meet again. That's what we'll see. Well, I'll see you on Zoom soon, probably. I'll see so. you. On Zoom. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Right. Bye, guys. Bye.